Hello, everybody. My name is Christopher Coker. I am director of LSE Ideas, which is the foreign policy think tank of the London School of Economics. And I'm delighted to be chairing this uh, session today. It's a standalone webinar on the crisis of the American empire from Afghanistan to Ukraine. Uh, Afghanistan, or rather the manner in which uh, uh, we left Afghanistan, I say we being the West, uh, obviously uh, created shockwaves and probably confirmed Vladimir Putin, amongst others, in his opinion that uh, the West was in terminal decline. That may or may not have influenced his decision to invade Ukraine. Ukraine is obviously the more important event of the two. It's historic. We can't say it's necessarily historical because only historians looking back will be able to tell us its historical significance, but we think we're pretty certain it's epochal. So for this reason, I think this panel is extremely timely, and I'm delighted that we have three extremely uh, important and noted speakers today. Um, starting with our first speaker, who is Gideon Ratman, who is Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent of the, uh, of the Financial Times, and in 2016 won the Orwell Prize uh, for journalism, his most recent book, just recently out, I believe, is The Age of the Strongman, looking at the alpha male phenomenon in international politics, uh, which tells us a lot, I think, about what is going on. He will speak first, but because he has to leave early, uh, I will ask him a few questions uh, at the end. And then we'll go on to our second speaker, who is a historian, uh, Margaret Macmillan, a present uh, Engelsberg uh, professor uh, at LSE Ideas, former Reith lecturer, and author of many well-received books, uh, including the, the Peacemakers. And finally, to my old colleague, Michael Cox, founding director of LSE Ideas, uh, now Emeritus Professor of International Relations. Um, and his forthcoming book deals with what many call the Russia-China axis or the Russia-China alignment, which again is extremely important in current circumstances. Um, each speaker will speak for 10 or 15 minutes uh, and then we will have a Q&A uh, session. When the questions uh, occur to you, will you please uh, post them up in the Q&A box? There will be a podcast uh, which will be published on our website uh, later, uh, I think either this week or next. So uh, Gideon, without further ado, can I turn over to you? Classic, I'm muted. You know, um, anyway, here, here I am. Thank you, Chris. And uh, thanks to Mick for giving us the occasion to, to have this discussion with your excellent book, Agonies of Empire, which I will hold up now, and which I think provides a starting point for, for our discussions tonight, because Mick asks a very good question in the book, which is why successive American presidents since Clinton have found the world so hard to manage? After all, Bill Clinton inherited kind of uniquely uh, optimistic, sunny global scenario, the Soviet Union had collapsed, and not only had it collapsed, it had collapsed relatively without violence, appeared to be trying to become more like its old adversary, the United States, couldn't be really be better. And yet, uh, it's been a very, very turbulent 30 years since then. I mean, Mick can summarize his own book, but I think he comes up with three broad themes. Uh, one was, uh, the, the emergence of rivals, China in particular, but also the resurgence of Russia. The second was um, mistakes. Things like invading Iraq did not help. Um, and the third, what I think uh, some people call black swans, unexpected events. I think just used to be called events, as Macmillan said. Um, things like the financial crisis, resurgence of populism in the West. So that in fact, by the time Biden takes office, he has almost the the flip side of, of what Clinton had when he, when he came in. If Clinton was facing a, a world that seemed almost too good to be true, Biden faces a world that feels uh, unprecedentedly dangerous because the danger is now coming from within the United States. I don't think one can underestimate the shock value of what had happened 14 days before he was sworn in on January the 6th. Uh, he's sworn in on the 20th. Uh, but January the 6th, the attempting storming of the capital, because it seemed to me, and certain, perhaps more significantly to people in Moscow and Beijing, to validate a lot of the, the worst, darkest scenarios about um, the future of the United States. Uh, here was a country that seemed almost on the brink of civil war. And I think that thinking back to how America had, inverted commas, won the Cold War, the Russians deeply resent that, but uh, that terminology, but um, it was really 
only partly because of things that America itself did. It was essentially because of the internal weaknesses of Soviet society, the fact that they were no longer a, a, a working, a functioning system. And then suddenly the thought occurred 30 years later that uh, you know, Reagan had said, freedom works. It seemed like such a vindication of American, the American way, globally and internally, success in the Cold War. And then 30 years later, you're saying, really, does freedom work? That is the question being asked by America's adversaries, but increasingly by Americans themselves. Um, and Biden faces this extremely difficult task, which he grasps in his inaugural speech. He says, more or less, my task is to save democracy both at home and overseas. Um, and for the first few months, it seems to be going okay. Uh, he gets, uh, you know, he's lucky enough to get the narrowest of majorities in Congress. He gets some important legislation through his opinion poll ratings are good. Uh, Trump is kind of raging away in Mar-a-Lago, but, you know, for a while he's forgotten. But then I think the turning point is actually, oddly, a foreign policy uh, debacle. I say oddly because I think one of Biden's initial assumptions was that actually uh, Trump was onto something when he said America first, not that his policies were right, but that he was correct to believe that Americans no longer wanted to, you know, we're in an inward looking phase and that you had to concentrate on making things better for the American middle class or everything else might fail. But then actually, as part of that, he decides we have to get out of Afghanistan. He decides to buck the conventional wisdom in Washington, which he correctly uh, believes has kept America in Afghanistan through review after review after review. Indeed, when Obama came in, he, he had thought about pulling out and had a big review. He was convinced to stay. There was a surge. This time Biden said, OK, fine, we're going to cut it off and leave. But it is a debacle that we all remember. And around that point, Biden's um, opinion poll ratings begin to plunge. And I don't think they've really ever recovered since. And it was a, a real shaker for the, uh, for the White House team. I mean, in some ways, they remind me a bit of that Dave, famous David Halberstam term about the, the Vietnam War team, the best and brightest. You know, uh, they are kind of Rhodes Scholars, Inc. They've all, uh, half, probably Margaret taught half of them, but uh, they're, they're, they're a clever, well-intentioned bunch, but they had um, presided over a real debacle. Um, so that by the time I visited Washington in the sort of dying days of uh, transatlantic travel actually being uh, not really possible, but interestingly, the Americans make exceptions for journalists. We were allowed in, whereas the Chinese exception for journalists is that we're not allowed in, but the Americans uh, gave, gave me a visa. And it was, it was a very interesting time. AUKUS had just been signed, but there was this kind of, I felt almost a panic is too strong a word, but a deep concern amongst the Biden team uh, only nine months in that the kind of shadow of losing the midterms and then of Trump coming back was already over them, partly because of Afghanistan. It was this sort of indissoluble link between domestic events and foreign events and the interplay between the two. Um, and, uh, but, but interestingly, although I think by a month after I'd left, so this, that was October and I had these conversations, at that time, there wasn't really much talk about Russia. Maybe I was asking the wrong questions. But by November, December, apparently, they're beginning to get these very disturbing warnings that Russia is poised to invade. Um, and, and indeed, that is what happened. Um, and, you know, in a strange way, it was an odd vindication of the American intelligence community, as they are known, um, because they've got so many things wrong. They were labeled as, uh, you know, the res responsible for the WMD fiasco in Iraq. They failed to anticipate the fall of Kabul uh, or how rapidly it would fall. But here they were, they said he's going to invade. They were saying, said it for two or three months. They said how he was going to invade and they were right. But they ran into a kind of wall of skepticism. And I remember I was in the Mu at Munich at the security conference just before the invasion. And it was terribly interesting because you know, if you spoke to them, uh, the, the US side and to the British, the Australians who are in the same kind of intelligence loop, they were all completely convinced that invasion would happen. But actually I spoke to people, there was a lone Russian who'd come from, from Moscow um, and I spoke to him and he said, no, no, Lavrov and Blinken will sort it out. It would be crazy for Putin to do this. Oddly, the Ukrainians agreed. I was at a dinner with the Ukrainians that night and they also didn't think it would happen. 
the Europeans pretty skeptical, but it did happen. Um, and interestingly, the Biden team who I met, or the people from it I met at that event were gloomy. They felt that not just about the state of the world, but also about this domestic political concern, which is never that far from their consciousness. One of them said to me, you know, we've actually feel we've handled this pretty well, but it's still going to be notched up as a debacle for America because, you know, it will be Putin rolling into Ukraine. And the one thing that they, that the intelligence people got wrong was they thought Russia would win very, very easily. Uh, three months on, or no, uh, yeah, not three months, six weeks on, um, it looks very different. Um, Putin is in, in, in dire trouble, um, and I think the Biden team are felt to have done well. Uh, one of the rare occasions of successful alliance management, um, and I think that one of the, they've been rewarded for a very stark contrast with the way that the Trump people did it. Blinken, Sullivan, and others um, realized from the very beginning that they needed that to keep their allies on board, that of course there would be disagreements but that a united Western Front would be very, very important. And there was something I heard Blinken say in the public bits of Munich, which, uh, you know, in a way it's a very obvious point, but, but it sort of struck me, um, was where he said, look, you know, if you put the whole of the West together, and this is not just the geographic West, but essentially the advanced democracies, we we'll still easily outmatch our rivals. Um, you know, if you have the EU and the US and Japan and Australia and Canada, um, South Korea, it's a lot, you know, it's a hell of a force to try to, to push back. So if you can organize that, you're in quite good shape. And the reason I suppose that struck me as an, you know, uh, an interesting thought is that we had got so used to looking not at Russia, but at the US-Chinese rivalry and at ticking off these indices of rivalry. Oh, China's economy is now by some measures as big as America's, China's economy is, uh, you know, the largest trader in the world, the largest manufacturer, China now even in terms of ships, has the largest navy in the world. Um, and if you saw it just as US China, um, it looked kind of uh, like America had finally met its match or was about to. But if you do what the Biden team are doing and try to keep a broader Western alliance together, or if you prefer an alliance of advanced democracies, uh, if you can make it as was it that Norwegian academic who called it an empire by invitation um, and, and, and a club that people want to be a member of and that where they realize that for all their differences and boy, there are differences between Germany and the US and France and, and you know, obviously the UK and the, the EU, but for all their differences, something, an invasion such as happened uh, in Russia uh, reminds us of A, what we have in common in terms of values, B, that there are such things as common threats, and C, the, the importance of unity, that we, that we really do need to um, hang together. And so I think at the moment, even though overall, obviously, this is an incredibly bleak moment in, in world history because uh, of the return of a large-scale war to European continent, um, the sense that uh, this could go on for a long time, the rest, the risks of escalation, which are real and we may want to talk about in a bit. Nonetheless, there's a kind of ray of hope for those in Washington and friends of those in Washington who hope that despite everything, uh, despite all the obvious criticisms that can be leveled at the United States, who don't really see an alternative ordering power in the world, that America has, has shown that it, you know, at its best, it is capable of rallying a Western coalition and acting effectively, uh, doing it on the basis of a mixture of values and deployable power. Um, and uh, for the moment, this, this crisis, although um, you know, bad on the surface, uh, and in reality is, is, at least from the point of view of Western policy, not going so badly. And it is possible to envisage that even amidst all the bloodshed and horror that's happening, there could be something positive coming out of it, which is that the kind of politics, international relations that Putin represents could suffer a major reverse. And the kind of thing that I write about in my book, The, the Age of the Strongman, the sort of return of authoritarian populist nationalism, which has really been a tide even in the United States with Trump uh, for the last 20 years, 
that, that it might have reached its high water mark with a massive miscalculation by Putin. So I'll leave, I'll stop with that for you. Thank you very much, uh, Gideon. Um, while we have you, can I ask a few questions? We have one question from a participant, so let me start with his question. It's really a, a guilty man question. Who were the American policy makers, if you want to name names, um, who should have known better about the return of great power competition, but didn't? Were there, were there good people in this story or were there bad people back in Washington? Well, there was always a, a debate. I think, I think it's been more of a process myself that, um, you know, there was the sort of sunny optimism period of the 90s, sort of heyday of liberal internationalism, where we felt that the rules-based order was a thing and that uh, Russia and China would really have to get with our program or they would fail. It was just kind of self-evident. Then I think... Gradually, over the course of the last decade or so, um, it's became, become apparent that that was way too optimistic. I think that maybe we hung on to those illusions for too long. Um, you could, uh, you know, I'm reluctant to name Obama as one of the guilty men. I think he was basically a good thing. But, you know, things like the attempted reset with Russia in 2008, which came just after they had invaded Georgia, Maybe that was, uh, you know, a miscalculation. But frankly, I think it was a miscalculation based almost from an overestimation of American power, that these guys, you didn't even really have to take these guys seriously. You just had to find some modus vivenda and keep them quiet. Um, I remember one of the Obama team at the time saying to me in one of those conversations that sort of stuck with me, he'd just been to Moscow and he said, they keep saying, let's do things 50-50. They've got to be kidding. It's not going to be that, it'd be 90-10. And in other words, they didn't really feel they needed to take Russian interests as Moscow perceived them seriously. Uh, now, you could argue whether that's right or wrong, and maybe they shouldn't have been taken seriously because Russian demands were unacceptable, but there was a dismissal. And then I think, you know, there are further turning points when China becomes super, uh, begins to assert itself in the South China Sea. That's a huge moment around 2014 um, and, and on and on. And, um, you know, Trump, for his own reasons, or rather the Trump team, actually write great power competition into the national security document they produce in 2017. So by then, I think people have accepted that this, that is the era we're in. And I think the Biden team, they were very much, when I saw them even before this invasion, talking in terms of great power competition, that, that's how they saw it. Indeed, at this point, it is the sort of remaining international cooperation people, the John Kerry's, et cetera, who are jumping up and down and saying, hang on, hang on, don't commit fully to great power competition because what are we going to do about climate change and so on. That school is important and it's still there, but I think they've been losing ground. Um, let me ask you another question. H.R. Uh, McMaster, in, in the book he produced, uh, I think last year, uh, said that the two biggest mistakes uh, from his point of view, both as a serving military officer and also as national security director, was America's strategic narcissism that the United States had concentrated entirely on itself, particularly the global war on terror. It was all about America's position in the world. And the second was a lack of strategic empathy uh, for people like Putin back in the days when people felt that Putin could be made a responsible stakeholder in the system. Would you say those, would you agree with him in that criticism uh, of American policy? Yeah, up to a point. I mean, I think that um, there was certainly a strong element of narcissism, I think even the right word, uh, in the run-up to um, the Iraq war. It was a mixture, a sort of dangerous mixture of narcissism, anger and panic, so that you have 9-11, and you then, I think the heyday of that is, and that sort of opens the door for the neocons, who have a kind of fully worked theory of the world that they can sort of wheel out and present in front of Bush, who was looking for one at that time to explain this, horrific event. And it is a kind of narcissistic theory that, you know, America is um, all powerful, uh, that it should be all powerful because it's also the most moral force in the world. And really all it needs to do is to assert its power and things will fall into place. And that theory was tested to destruction in, in, in Iraq. Um, then I think you know, there's an interesting kind of mix of a moral and strategic question. When you say take their interests seriously, do you go sort of full John Mearsheimer and say, we're not going to have any moral judgments here. We're just going to see them as another power and that you need to accommodate and, 
uh, or or are you uh, do you retain a little bit of the neocon instinct to say, well, fine, let's try and understand them, but let's not also lose confidence in our faith in democracy, etc. And even if you know you put yourselves in the shoes of Putin, by all means, but also maybe put yourselves in the shoes of Ukrainians or the Baltic states, and they also have a viewpoint. And then you have to ask yourself, well, can we, uh, how much can we protect them? You know, how far are we prepared to go? And that's sort of, I think, the world we're in now. Okay. And one last question before you go. Since you have written the book, Strong Man, could you just say a few words on Putin, the man, uh, in this particular Ukraine crisis? Yeah. I mean, so I think that he's, the question is, is a lot of people said, my God, goodness, we didn't think that's what he was like when he did this invasion, that we thought we understood him. He, nobody thought he was a nice guy by 2020, but they thought that he was a shrewd, calculating person, that he would take big risks, but not crazy risks. Uh, that, you know, so he would do a Georgia or, um, you know, the, the 2014 annexation of Crimea intervention in Syria, um, but that he... Uh, would would always preserve deniability and he wouldn't bite off more than he could chew. That he would do something this massive, I think, uh, surprised a lot of people, surprised a lot of Russians, apart, let alone in the West. But, I, you know, to the extent it fits in with my whole sort of strongman thesis, I think that one of the flaws in the strongman model, which are becoming emerging, which are emerging, uh, well, there are many flaws, but two that I would highlight that I think apply to Putin is firstly, the megalomania that sets in and the isolation that sets in once you've been in power for 20 years, Putin probably has changed because I think, you know, somebody put it to me, he hasn't had to open a door for 20 years. He's, he's used to now complete deference uh, and therefore his assumptions aren't challenged, aren't tested. Um, and we saw that in that extraordinary meeting where he kind of humiliates his own national security staff and it's pretty clear this is his call and they are just meant to say yes and that's a very dangerous way to to run a society because anybody makes mistakes and particularly perhaps somebody who has been in power for 20 years or so and who also I think another trap of these people is they begin to start thinking rather too hard about their own place in history and I think Putin probably got to that phase he started evidently writing long historical essays on Russia and Ukraine situating himself in a sort of three, four centuries worth of Russian history and more and what he's going to do. Um, so yes, uh, this man who had appeared, who had attracted a lot of admirers around the world, incidentally, that's another kind of theme in my book. It's, it's really not hard to find any number of world leaders, not just Marine Le Pen, saying at times, you know, Putin, he's, he's, I really respect him. I mean, Rudy Giuliani, I think, said that he was the, you know, the master of strategy somebody Americans could learn from. Um, but, but eventually he gets to the stage where he makes what looks like a major, major miscalculation. But of course, it's super dangerous because the other thing about being a strongman leader is at a certain point it becomes too dangerous to leave power because you may end up in prison, you may end up being prosecuted. This is something we've seen in Africa uh, over the years as well. And the difficulty is that Putin can't lose and there isn't a system that can remove him that we can see without essentially a coup d'etat in Russia. Um, so that is, uh, you know, a big structural danger associated with strongman rule. Well, thanks very much for coming on. And I know you have to, to go now, but uh, we appreciate it. No, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll sit and listen to the discussion, if I may, for 10 minutes and then I'll... Absolutely, absolutely. I was just saying it does take two people to open some of those doors in the Kremlin, though, doesn't it? Very, <laughs> yes, I, I don't think that can be literally true. Yeah. <laughs> you must have opened the bathroom door, but one gets the general point. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> but thanks very much. Um, Margaret, can we move on to you? Thank you. Well, I, I so much enjoyed that, um, uh, Gideon Rackman. Thank you. And, and I've also enjoyed, enjoyed the book. Um, what comes out to me more and more, both in what you just said um, and in, in what Mick Cox has said in his, his very interesting book, is how important at certain points in history those in positions of power can be. And of course, we'd all rather live in a world that doesn't matter who's in office, um, you know, that the system is strong enough to just keep things going. But occasionally, I think it really does matter. And I think it is important, therefore, to try and understand Putin just as it was important and maybe important again, alas, to try and understand what makes Donald Trump tick. 
that these people can make a difference, not just in the image they project of their country. Um, you think of Kaiser Wilhelm, uh, sorry, historians always go back, but you think of Kaiser Wilhelm II before the First World War, who was reckless and said a lot of stupid things, which left an impression of a Germany that was reckless and likely to be a threat to the peace of Europe. And so I think what, what um, Gideon has done in, in his book and Mick, Mick has done in his is to look at some of those actors and to take seriously what they say. And this is in some ways an old fashioned sort of thing to do, but to actually look at the statements they put out. If they take the trouble to write as Putin did that long and, and very bad essay. I mean, if I were grading his essay on the relationship between Russians and Ukrainians, um, I would probably um, give it a D and say, where's your evidence um, if I didn't fail it. But the fact that he wrote it, that he took credit for it, I think is important. And therefore we need to understand that. What I also think we're coming back to, and the word's already been used, is this notion of empire. And I sometimes think that we, at least in scholarly circles, have been so preoccupied with the dark side of empire, which goodness knows exists, in particular the dark side of European empires, that we've tended to overlook the fact that empire is probably the most persistent form of human government down through history, like it or not. Um, you know, we see throughout history, peoples from one part of the world, perhaps marked by a distinct culture, perhaps marked by a different language, perhaps marked by a different set of values or beliefs, religious beliefs, ruling over other peoples. Um, you know, the, the great Persian empires, the great Assyrian empires, the great Babylonian empires, the Egyptian empires, the Roman empire. I mean, these were very important and, and, and often persisted for a very long time. And whatever we think about the good or bad sides of empire, I think we need to deal with them. And that in a way, I think is why it's important, Mick, that in your book, you talk about um, the American empire. And you argue, I think quite forcefully, the United States has been an empire. It hasn't necessarily directly taken over other peoples, but it has often arrogated to itself the right to interfere in their affairs. Um, Woodrow Wilson, the great liberal, did something like 10 armed interventions in Mexico and, and Central America and in the Caribbean before the First World War. And on one occasion, he said famously, I think about the Mexicans, we will make them democratic in spite of themselves. And that seems to me a classic imperialist viewpoint. And um, these people are there to be civilized, they will become like us. Um, and so I think whatever we think about empire in moral terms, I think we need to deal with it very seriously in, in political terms. And the United States, I think, has been an empire. And, and Gerd Lundestad, who de developed that phrase, empire by invitation, I think was onto something. The European nations in the West, when they saw the massive force of the Soviet Union, they saw the empire it was establishing in the center of Europe, wanted some protection, and they put themselves under the protection of the United States. I think what also comes out in Mick's book, and, and I, I appreciate very much that you do the history, that to understand the United States, you go back into the, into the past to understand how it develops ideas. And what really strikes me is, is the development of American exceptionalism, which goes hand in hand with isolationism. And you have this wonderful phrase, Mick, that as the United States rose to power, and as it, of course, something Americans often forget, as it conquered the indigenous peoples um, in the West, made them part of its empire, that it didn't have external enemies. As, as you said, it had nothing more threatening than Mexicans, Canadians, and fish. Now, I just want to make one exception here, and that's as a Canadian, um, they would have been sorry if they'd tangled with us, um, just, just to let you know. We had, a, we had a wonderful plan in the 1930s where if war had come between the British Empire and the United States, which people did think was a possibility on both sides, Canadian forces were going to swoop very quickly down the Mississippi Valley and divide the United States in half, at which point the Americans would have sued for peace. But I think, I take your point, that the United States has developed this sense of, of its own exceptionalism and a sense, which I suppose has often driven empires, of its rightness, its rightness to do what it's doing, um, that it offers something to these peoples that it is taking under its wings. And so I think this comes out very strongly. I think what also is coming out, and again, it's partly in, in Gideon Rackman's remarks, but also in your book, Mick Cox, is the temptations of power. When you have a great deal of power, you think you can fix everything. And you think others will recognize that you have that power, that you can reach out your hand and simply tell people what to do. And I think that's what the Americans came up against in Afghanistan, they came up against it in Iraq, they came up against it earlier in Vietnam, that those they were trying to um, change perhaps, manipulate, 
often as Americans saw it for the better, in fact didn't want to be changed and had their own ways of doing things and had their own powers of resistance. And I think this is what has led the United States into some of these adventures, um, the attitude. You have that wonderful phrase in your book, um, Mick, where Charles Krauthammer says, why be a pygmy when you could be Prometheus? And I think that temptation is always there for great powers, that you get besotted with your own power and you refuse to recognize that others may have different ideas. And I think that's certainly what's happening today in Ukraine with Putin and the Russians. And I think a lot of us who, who initially thought Ukraine was bound to lose looked at the hardware. We looked at the numbers. We looked at the size of the Russian army. We looked at its tanks. We looked at its planes. We looked at how much hardware it had. And we thought there's no way the Ukrainians can do anything about this. And I think what a lot of us failed to take into account was the Ukrainians' views on this and the fact that they had a different reason for fighting the Russians. Um, you know, that what has really been clear, I think, is the Russians coming into Ukraine often didn't know what they were coming into, often thought they were in exercises, didn't want to be there. Um, when they were there, took every opportunity to loot what they could and scuttle back to Belarus and try and send it back to their families somewhere in Russia. Whereas the Ukrainians were fighting um, for their homeland, they were fighting to save those that they loved. And of course, the more the Russians commit atrocities, I think the stronger, not weaker, that feeling will grow. I, I think we have to look, as, as, as you both have done at the United States, because it still is a very great superpower. And we've tended to assume that because the United States is no longer as powerful as it was in, in certain areas, that it's in decline. I think it's premature. I think the United States has been in decline before. It was very badly damaged by the Vietnam War. After the First World War, it withdrew partly from international relations, but it has tremendous assets, tremendous power, and, and a tremendous capacity, let's not forget, to reinvigorate and reinvent itself. I mean, I think that in the long run is the strength of democracies, that they can admit mistakes, unlike autocracies, and they can sometimes deal with them. And that's not to say that uh, the next presidential election isn't going to be absolutely crucial. And if I want to have nightmares, I think about President Trump or perhaps one of his uh, children being elected president, which, which I think is enough um, to worry us all. But I think what also comes out, um, and I, I'll, I'll stop in a moment because I'm sure there are lots of questions, are the challenges which the United States in its apparent moment of triumph in the 1990s faced. And one of those was how to develop a grand strategy. In a way, the Cold War had imposed a grand strategy. It was quite clear the Soviet Union was to be contained. It was to be um, dealt with if it tried to push too far. The United States was to maintain its vigilance. It was to attempt to find allies or at least keep key countries neutral. And with the disappearance of that, the United States, I think, has been somewhat floundering, looking for, for a grand strategy. Um, the war on terror was, I think, a disaster as a grand strategy. As, as Michael Howard, and you quote him in your book, Mick, said very wisely, you can't make war on a concept. And if you're making war, you need to know what the definition of your victory is and what's going to happen after the war ended. And the war on terror has, has not had that. Each president you look at, Clinton, Bush II, um, Obama, and, and then Trump, have tried to, well, Trump, I think, didn't try and develop a grand strategy. People tried to develop one for him. Yeah. Um, Trump, I think, relies more on his own intuitions um, and has no grand strategy, but certainly those around him tried to come up with something. But each has tried to develop a grand strategy and each has had its problems. Just to give you one example, Bill Clinton's grand strategy, which was to focus on the economy and focus on making American trade um, do very well around the world trade and investment, which also, however, had in it somewhere the promotion of democracy. And those two ideas were often in tension and grand strategies can, can be like that. What also comes out, I think, um, is, is globalization. Um, it's, it's one of the players in your book and one of the key players in the past 20 years. And globalization, I think, as we began to realize by the end of the 1990s, brought enormous benefits, but also had enormous costs. And that in turn, the, the move of jobs offshore, the loss of well-paying jobs for people in the middle classes, the impoverishment of those who had hoped that their children would have better lives than them, the, the growing um, difficulties in, in many countries, the hollowing out of economies. And if you drive through parts of the United States, you'll see these lovely towns, the same thing in Canada, um, beautiful, beautiful houses, obviously once very prosperous, and they're basically rotting from within. Um, you know, the, the shops have closed, the, 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 those who can get out, and the jobs have simply moved away. 
And, you know, there are jobs, perhaps if, if there's a big box store near you, if there's an Amazon Depot, but those aren't the sort of jobs that give people a sense of life. And so we have seen the growth of populism. And this, I think, has been a worldwide phenomenon. I would distinguish between the populism that wants to work within democratic bounds and is prepared to accept democratic norms and institutions and the populism like Orban's, which will use democratic means to get into office and then destroy democracy. Um, I think that is far more dangerous. And I think the second kind is more likely, although the first kind has it as well, to have elements of attacking others, blaming others, um, whether it's internal enemies in Hungary, such as the Roma, or whether it's immigrants. Um, these, these become very, very, um, very, very strong messages. So we have a number of questions, and I, I think, Nick, I'd love you to comment on them, and I'm sure the audience will have it. Um, what is the United States going to do? You, you conclude that it may indeed remain, I'm quoting from your book, the most powerful country in the world, but one suspects that until it can heal itself, and there is every chance it will remain what one American called many years ago, a crippled giant with more power at, at its disposal than any nation in the world. Sorry, I'm just going to need to get my... Polarized at home, polarized, but polarized at home, so polarized at home that it will be unable to use it wisely as well. And so perhaps I can just leave with, with, with a couple of questions. Um, you see the China relationship is strong and getting closer. Um, you, you believe it's built not just on shared um, strategic interests, but also on hostility to the West and, and to Western values and it, on its opposition to a unipolar world dominated by the United States. Do you still see it that way today? I think when you wrote the book, you weren't to know that there was going to be a war in Ukraine. And so I wonder if you can also say more generally, has the war changed any of the things you've written? Would, would you add anything? Would you write anything differently today? And might you want to say something about a topic I think is important, and that is the place of military power in international relations. I think we'd tended to overlook it perhaps um, in the years after the, 19, after, after the end of the, of the Cold War, but perhaps we're realizing again that military power is a very important component of international relations, whether you use it for deterrence or whether you use it to project your power. So I'll, I'll leave you with that, but I, I did enjoy the book very much, so thank you. Thanks very much, Margaret. Um, Mick, since we've mentioned the book so often, would you like to just show us it? Yeah, I, I uh, oddly enough, I don't have one here with me. You had it in your hand a moment ago. I did, I did yes. I'm, I'm carrying it around all the time with me. Uh, here we are, everybody. Sorry, can you see it? There it is. Agonies of Empire. Yes, we can. Agonies of Empire. Thank you very much. Thank, so thank Mick, you. Mick, thank over you to you. Much. And if you'd like to answer uh, Margaret's questions at the end or during your presentation, yeah, let's I, know. I, Th thank you, Christopher. I hope I'm coming over uh, loud and clear. I will come back to your two questions at the end, Margaret, on Russia and China. And I'm, I'm now writing a book uh, on that um, uh, in order to answer, not to answer your question, but to answer the question that's been going through my mind, the role of China in this particular war. Um, and then on the question of military power, now I can answer that one, I think, more quickly. Uh, with the exception of one or two people at the LSE IR department, I think the LSE generally tended not to do military stuff so much. I, did we leave it too much to kings? I'm not so sure, but but I entirely agree with you. I mean, IR has been you know strong on theories, strong on all sorts of things, talking about globalization, many many other things. Not enough, I think, ever done really on 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 the military side of, of international relations. I think that's been either left to other people in other places. And I think it's actually moved off the agenda for IR. I don't know if Christopher's got some thoughts on that as well, but uh, and I think to the detriment of, of, of international relations. But I'll come back to the first question again at the very end, Margaret, because my, my, my quick answer to your question is, I, I, I think that it has made the relationship between China and Russia more complicated, more difficult. It has raised enormous problems for China, yet it moves, to, to use a phrase. Um, and I don't see yet, and I'll emphasize the word yet, any move by China to seriously distance itself from Russia over this war, although it says let's have peace. And I don't see any serious move by China to blame the war on anybody except the United States and NATO. So we can come back to that and maybe that's open for, for Q&A at the very end, Chris. And more generally, thank you very much both to uh, Gideon for his uh, great observations and Margaret 
for your very nice things you said about the the book. Um, I, I'm pleased that you didn't object to the term empire because nearly everybody who's been criticised in the book does for some one reason or another. I, I I have no problem using the term empire to describe. It's not an empire in the sense that the British was an empire or Roman Empire. In a sense, it's not a territorial empire. But in terms of its global reach, in terms of the norms it sets, in terms of its extensive military power, to come back to that, all, all of the things taken together, setting the rules of the game, seeing itself as playing an imperial role, although it doesn't call itself an empire, all of those things together seem to me to suggest that what we're looking at here is the modern liberal empire, and I have no problems in thinking about that. But the title of the book, as, as you point out, is Agonist. Let me start off with a, with a kind of a qualification straight away. The, the, the title is very dramatic. In the end, I also argue, Margaret, and, and I think you and I agree on this because you made that same point. In a way, the United States still remains after 30 years of setbacks, mistakes, miscalculations, all the things that Gideon mentioned at the very beginning. The United States still remains, I think, still by far and away the most powerful actor in the international system. It may have lost a lot of soft power uh, under Trump. It may have made some miscalculations, resetting the relationship with Russia just after the Georgia invasion. I think the Iraq war was a strategic mass massive miscalculation, many, many other things besides. Yet again, it has still re retains formidable economic, military, and indeed even soft power and institutional power. And I suppose the best measure of its power is the fact that so many still want to sit under the umbrella of the United States. You, you, our good friend, my old good friend, Gail Lundestad in Norway, the Nobel Institute, used that wonderful term empire by invitation, namely that it's not an empire that's being imposed, although sometimes that has happened. It is an empire that is it's kind of protection, uh, uh, which, which, uh, which people ha have demanded, uh, both in terms of Europe and in terms of Asia. And that I think has come out very clearly too, by the way, in the whole debate about what's going on in Russia and Ukraine today. You know, people, America didn't impose NATO. I mean, this is a kind of mis 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 way of thinking, thinking about it. I don't think America imposed NATO. I think it was demanded by most of the countries of East Central Europe for fear of Russia. I mean, maybe I'm naive and maybe I'm reading the wrong books or the wrong memos, but it seems to me it was a number of countries in East Central Europe which demanded it rather than America simply imposing. In fact, at first, the United States had some reservations about in, enlarging or expanding NATO, but that we can come on to that, no doubt, in the Q&A. But the United States still retains, uh, in spite of all the agonies and the problems we're facing and will continue to face, the United States still retains and remains the most powerful country within the international system. Paul Kennedy put it to me rather nicely once, the great writer on the decline of all great powers, including the United States, I suppose, in a relative sense. He said, the United States may be the one that declines to decline. And, and maybe that's the way we've got to think of Think of the United States as a, as, as a great power. It, it must, it's got some exceptional assets, an exceptional position within the system, which does it, which means we can't just we can't just argue by historical analogy. In other words, because other great powers have declined in the past, and one after the other, if you like, right up to the end of the Soviet Union itself, uh, the United States is maybe not in the same in the same category. And perhaps what we're seeing with the Soviet Union stroke Russia today. There's, there's a, a slip of the tongue. What we're seeing with Russia today is, in some sense, a country or a leader of a country in the shape of Putin attempting to deal with decline, the decline of a superpower. With decline in 89 when it lost, uh, as it saw, it lost East and Central Europe, lost when Germany was united, lost when the USSR itself disintegrated, and less, lost dramatically economically in the 1990s. And in some sense, I see Putinism as a response to, to, to imperial decline and an attempt, very brutal as we know, and not just in Ukraine, but in Georgia and Bosnia and elsewhere, to reconstitute uh, Russian power with, with some fairly disastrous, and I think uh, disastrous consequences, not just for Ukraine and the countries that, 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 are, that are invaded, but also ultimately for Russia itself. Can you ever prevent decline? if you use the kinds of mechanisms that Russia has at its disposal. In the end, of course, I do ask the question, which uh, Gideon mentioned very quickly at the beginning of his comments. Um, some things have gone wrong. 
with the United States. I'm, I'm not an uncritical admirer of all things that America does, far from it. Uh, it's easy to say there were individual mistakes. You know, Republicans will always blame the Democrats. Clinton went on a holiday from history. I remember that wonderful phrase. You know, uh, the, the whole Trump administration then blamed all the problems of the United States on Obama before. And of course, the, the Democrats in turn then blamed everything on G.W. Bush, the so-called war on terror. And then, you know, Biden comes in and says all the problems are actually really about Trump. I, I, although I do believe individuals matter, Margaret, entirely, and we can come back to that in the Q&A, I kind of try to keep it away from seeking responsibility in either a single administration or indeed with, with a single president, whatever I think of them myself personally. And what I've really tried, tried to do is, um, is take three arguments, if you like, slightly different to the ones that um, were put forward by Gideon, in which I tried to outline, how do we try and explain some of the problems, put it like that. Um, and I've got three, three words in front of me, hubris, backlash, balance of power. Let me start with the first one on hubris. I think there's no question, in my own mind anyway, that the victory that the United States and the West achieved over, East, over, over Central Europe, uh, over, over the Soviet Union, was probably too complete in many ways. <laughs> it, it was such a victory. And I think there's no question the 1990s produced its own kind of hubris. You know, we have won. It's not just the end of history, but we've just won. Our ideas have won, our values have won. Um, and I think what then happens, and again, I, I throw this argument out for debate. I think what then happens, that the hubris then expresses itself. And here I do agree with John Mearsheim. I disagree with him on one or two other things. But I think that a kind of liberal hubris took over. That You could remake the world in a liberal way. Um, you could integrate enemies, the responsible stakeholder theory. Um, Iraq, in a sense, was more a liberal war than a realist war. It was fought for democracy promotion. Even 2008, I think, grew out of a certain kind of economic hubris that markets would always find an equilibrium. The kind of notion that markets would always solve everything. It was a kind of an economic liberal hubris. And I think, in a way, too much power can sometimes be uh, a greater threat uh, than, than, than too little. I think the second thing, and you mentioned this, Margaret, and I'm glad you did, and I do discuss it in the book, although maybe not enough, it's a kind of backlash against globalization. Now, we were warned uh, by a number of good writers on this. There's some pretty bad writers on globalization, but there were some good writers in the 1990s who warned on uh, the dangers of too much globalization, hyper-globalization. The best by far, in my opinion, was Danny Roderick, by the way. Um, and I think he's still writing some very, very good work on the, on the, on, on, on the downsides of globalization. But he was warning about this in 1997 saying, has globalization gone too far? As we integrate globally, we're seeing disintegration domestically in a number of Western societies, the sort of thing that you refer to, Margaret, the hollowing out of a number of uh, industrial towns which are no longer industrial. And there was a backlash against globalization, not in, the, not in China, not in India, not, and not actually in large parts, some parts of the global south, but in the West, in the advanced West, because once they opened up to globalization, who were the beneficiaries of this? Well, the real beneficiaries of it, and I, I quote Martin Wolf here, the real beneficiaries of it tended to be Asian countries merging and rising, and of course, China. And I think that is, the, in that way, I think we can in part explain Trump. I mean, we can go into all the fantasies of Trump's own mad prognoses and arguments, but the, what I call the, the heart of Trumpism, if you like, the rational heart of Trumpism, was this ability to know that globalization, was undermining certain core values, undermining jobs, leading to a loss of job, and indeed, to, to use a phrase, even to a loss of a notion of identity, which disappeared, as he argued, because of, of globalization. And I think, again, Trump, Trump, I thought, brilliantly exploited that, actually, to be perfectly honest. Um, the third argument I'd argue about what went wrong, one is hubris, uh, one is the backlash of globalization. I suppose the third one is the old IR argument, balance of power. I mean, the old IR realists like Kenneth Waltz and others said very clearly in the 1990s, hey guys, unipolarity can't last. <laughs> you can't have a, an, a, an international system where there's only one power. 
You know, I mean, he time and again, Ken, before he passed away, sadly, and then many, many others like Ken said, look, you simply can't have a one power international system. Other powers will rise up as they have done in the past. You know, this is a kind of an historical law of international relations, whether or not it's true or not. That's how I think people like Ken Walt saw it, he, again, John Mearsheimer too, that other powers will in inevitably arise, which will challenge the dominant power within the order that that power is trying to create. And I suppose in some ways, without putting a gloss on what, what Russia is doing, and I'm not trying to do that, of course, in some ways, I think what we're seeing in the behavior of both Russia and China from an IR point of view is not abnormal. I mean, this war is abnormal, but in a sense, the idea that Russia, a, a kind of post-imperial great power, with great power pretensions, and China a rising power would not challenge that order, I think was you know, the height of naivete. And, and they would not easily incorporate it, integrate it into the system. You know, the notion of making them responsible stakeholders wasn't a bad idea, but I think it was one that it was going to be very, very difficult uh, uh, to implement. And actually going back, looking back uh, as an historian, as I tried to, like yourself, Margaret, actually one of the most important speeches that Putin made wasn't just that strange essay, which was a long essay he wrote in July last year on Ukraine not being a nation. Strange, strange argument to say the least. It was something he said at the, at the Munich conference. I, I know that uh, Gideon uh, goes to the Munich conferences. I've never had an invitation myself. We'll, we'll wait and see. But in, I think it was in 2009, was it, or 2007, Putin kind of made a perfectly strong realist case against unipolarity, saying it was unnatural and it, and it can't last. And of course, the Chinese too have taken a very strong view against what they call hegemonism. So in a way, what we're seeing in the case of China and Russia, and it will bring me on to the question of what's happening in the war, is in a sense, the working out of the international system, as indeed over many years, it has worked itself out. Namely, they are trying to reassert their position within the system or assert their position within a system within which the United States has been dominant and wanted to remain dominant. And, and that, I suppose, that's trying to explain it in IR terms without getting caught too much in the longer longer term arguments about are they good or bad systems or are they good or bad moral orders i think there were two things we didn't get right there and two things i didn't get right and i'm trying to make up for it now i think and i guess gets back to this china russia question margaret maybe you and i have a certain disagreement or maybe some different nuance about this because i know you've been doing some wonderful lectures on alliances Many years ago, too many years ago, 2016, I, I penned a, a, an article which made the case, even back then, five, six years ago, on the question as to whether or not, and it wasn't just about being anti-America or anti-liberal, there was more to it than that, that China and Russia will find ways to work themselves, work together over key issues of either domestic legitimacy, stability, sovereignty, resisting liberalism, resisting American power, resisting the West's ability to write all the rules of the game. And I do think that relationship has consolidated, actually, after the first Ukraine crisis. Now, the more I look back on it now, I think it was in, it was in, it was in situ before, but it was the first Ukraine crisis of 2014, which I think really launched this, properly speaking, which brings me then to the second Ukraine crisis, Margaret, in answering your question. It's certainly true that, as I'm only repeating myself here, that China has found some real problems dealing with this. You can see this in its ambiguous statements on all the sorts of things it's saying, let's have peace and all the rest of it. We are not partners, we're not players in this war. We want peace to happen. But everything it has actually done and said since has supported, has supported Russia throughout. And I'm not so sure it's challenging that relationship. I think, you know, to use the Dolly Parton, stand by your man. I think that in, in essence, it seems to me that, that China has made a strategic decision of a partnership with Russia, which was made fairly clear in that 4th of February communique, Margaret, of, of earlier this year. You know, I mean, that was an extraordinary statement. And I think to revoke, go back on that now would be seen as a major, major, major strategic uh, reversal. Uh, for China. So in answer to your question, I think the, the relationship will remain whatever the tensions and the stresses. And let's be honest, Margaret, all alliances or whatever you want to call their relationship always have tensions and stresses. Think of think of France within NATO, think of 
Hungary within NATO, you know, so I, I don't see that too much problem. Look, the one question I'll end on is this, though. Sorry for my fairly incoherent reflections. But it's, it's so many big questions and so many interesting points to make, I hope. Getting back to this question of American power, I think this is at the heart of what I've tried to argue, and I'm now writing something on this. I think that one of the, one of the major miscalculations that Putin and I think the Chinese have made, um, and it's not just about the miscalculation about the war, and that was a miscalculation enough, although we'll have to wait and see what finally works out in this terrible, terrible situation. I think one of the major miscalculations they made was to believe that the United States and the West was in terminal decline. You know, I, the more I look back now, there's a theme. It comes out time and again. You can see it in Putin's statements. I think Christopher alluded to it in, in your opening comments, Christopher. You certainly see it in, in the Chinese debates after 2008. One thing after another happening in the West proves not only to the Chinese, but to the Russians together, and they do talk a lot to each other, obviously, proves to them that this Western dominant economic, political, military order is in, is in a sense in, in terminal decline, even terminal decay. Uh, look at the mess that happened over Iraq. Look at the 2008 financial crisis. Look at Trump. Again, an illustration of the fundamental problems involved of democracy. Um, look how the West and the United States particularly dealt with the COVID crisis. And look how well we were told at least six months ago, how well China was dealing with that. That crisis. Moreover, I think this also fits, feeds into a whole series of moral questions about West, Western moral decline, you know, gay marriage and all the kind of other things associated with liberalism. And I, I just wonder, and I throw this out as, a, as, as kind of a, a, a discussion point, but I think, it's, I think it's very, very serious whether this has been a major miscalculation by Russia and China. But they were pushing at an open door, you know, to, to use the old Maoist phrase, the United States was a paper tiger. And that all the things that had happened within NATO, between NATO, the Afghanistan withdrawal added to all that, all pointed to a downward trajectory of American power, Western power. The Europeans would never respond anyway because they only love peace, they only love gas, they only like pipelines, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I wonder again if this shouldn't be seen as central to the decision making that's been going on inside Beijing and Moscow over the last few years towards the United States. In other words, we get back, and this is my last point, uh, Christopher, we get back to a point made many years ago by one of the great writers on international relations, sadly now dead, uh, Robert Jervis, who talked about perceptions, misperceptions in international relations. You know, he wrote that wonderful book back in the 70s, still his, one, of his, one of his many great books, but his greatest, I think, by far. And I wonder the degree to which the whole debate in the West has filtered into the debates within Russia and within China that the West was in terminal decline and therefore, I'm not saying this therefore causes the war or leads to the war, but provides an intellectual framing within which you could push very hard and probably almost certainly not find the sort of resistance which, which has actually happened. And here again is that, that element of miscalculation you talked about, Margaret. So with those few comments, uh, Christopher, I shall conclude and say thank you very much for hosting this event. Thank you very much Mick, um, uh, excellent and I think we've set up for the next 30 minutes we certainly have enough questions <laughs> to keep us going. So what I'm going to suggest is that um, I ask you a question of my own and then we, we ask the participants and Margaret uh, these questions are addressed to both of you and you may want to respond to some of the things Mick has said but if you would do so in your first response to the first question. So um, my question is about declinism Mick I mean, one of the reasons I think why the Russians and Chinese think the West is in decline is because we think it is. Uh, and it has been said that declinism is a thoroughly Western phenomenon. Mm. Other civilizations do not talk about decline, they talk about disintegration. So for China, the master text is the Warring Kingdoms. Uh, There's four centuries in which the, the, the country was unable, or oh, the century of humiliation, the 19th century when it was unable to defend itself. But we, our master text is the fall of the Roman Empire which we're absolutely obsessed with. And when we talk about empire, we immediately think of decline and fall. So what's your response? I mean, Margaret, as a historian, what would your response be to that? But Mick, 
Uh, do you think that that yeah. is, is fair? And secondly, yeah. sure. because this is actually a question that has been asked, can, can you have an empire of the woke? So in other words, <laughs> since you've mentioned the cultural wars, yeah. although you did so indirectly, yeah. can you actually have an imperial power that doesn't believe in the civilizing mission or the historical myths yeah. that are so essential for any great power to sustain its self-confidence yeah, and its yeah, self-belief. So those, those are two questions. Again, Margaret, you're in a very well a place uh, to answer maybe, those questions. Maybe, maybe, I'll, maybe. Leave I'll, I'll leave Margaret to talk about the empire of the world. That's a, that's a fantastic question, I have to say. Um, you, you're quite right, Christopher. I mean, looking back as I've done over many years on, uh, on, on decline, <laughs> and the question of the United States, I constantly confronted what I thought was a real problem. All I kept seeing was how much power the United States had, however many mistakes it made, okay? All I could see is that you could go to war in Iraq and you still come home, as my good friend Bill Walforth once said, the United States goes to war and the, and the Americans go, go shopping. I mean, and let, let foreigners pick up, the, pick up the problems afterwards. Um, you know, you can almost, devolve your wars to somebody else to pay or, or whatever and, and so I, I constantly confronted this reality which I've been talking about for about 10 years this extraordinary power of the United States uh, um, much to the consternation of many of my students you know uh, but nonetheless I, I still end up even in 2022 in spite of Afghanistan and withdrawal and all the rest of it and in spite of Trump, nonetheless, looking at the, the fundamental structural power of the United States, very much like Susan Strange did back in the, in the late 70s and early 1980s, and I still see a formidable array of extraordinary great American power, however, however, however you define power, both economic, soft power and cultural power, and indeed military power, to come back to, to what Margaret said. Yet, and you're quite right to ask the question, when one looks on the bookshelves, <laughs> you go, go around you know, various bookshelves or, or bookstores and things like that. You know, every other, every other book on the United States has something about the end of the empire or the decline of the United States. I mean, I, I, I do a lecture on declinism. And indeed, this, this theme of declinism, even in America, goes back even to the Vietnam War. And Margaret, I think, again, hinted at this. The United States has declined so many times over the last 25 or 30 years, you wonder when it's actually going to happen, you know. You know, it, it's the Mark Twain argument, isn't it? You know, <laughs> my demise has been talked about so frequently now, I'm wondering what everybody's talking about. So it is true, yeah. Now, is, is, is this therefore something that academics need to do? Is it something that intellectuals love engaging in? Is it, I, I don't know. Is, is, it, is it a morphology of, of the way that intellectuals, the intellectual class, if we are such a thing, you know, need to talk not about the rise of an empire, but actually why, why they decline. And it's very much, again, as I think you said, very much embedded in, in, in our whole, you know, what I call it almost, our historiography locked into our brains. There's a wonderful book I just read, The Theme of Decline in Western History, which, and, and again, it does go back, as you point out, to the Roman Empire, but it goes back to each empire itself has declined. As Paul Kennedy pointed out, in his marvelous book, which got everything right except the United States, in in, in my opinion. So it's because we've been talking about it for so long, that in, in not surprisingly, you know, it, it, they've caught on to this somehow in Moscow and in Beijing and amongst the intellectuals. When I'd been to China many years ago now, um, there was always talk to me and say, "Well, it's, the United States is just going like the Br British Empire." Actually, even in, even in China, one of the things I found very interesting is. The United States is going like the Soviet Union. This was a fascinating discussion. It's, it's, it's exhibiting all the problems of the Soviet system just before it collapsed, which is an interesting analogy, one that Putin, I think, wouldn't particularly like. On the empire of the woke, hmm, not sure about that. I, I'll have to think about that one, but uh, maybe Margaret would like to pick up on that one. But it is something clearly that, you know, Putin has put, picked up on several times. The Chinese less so, I think, but Putin has certainly picked up on mm. the whole question of what he calls cultural decline, the decline of traditionalism, the decline of the family, the decline of traditional roles for men and women, etc. Yeah. And no doubt he's seen that as another aspect of cultural decline. The Russians don't talk about, um, if the Russians talk about decline, they know who's responsible, the weak czars. And if you want <laughs> Russia to be back on its feet, you find yourself a strong czar. That, that I think, is very much the discourse. But anyway, Margaret, over to, to you. Um, I, I sometimes think that both the Russians and the Chinese 
partly because of the value structure in their own society, pay too much attention to intelligentsia and academics. Um, you know, China has a long tradition of listening to its academics, um, the whole scholar class, and Russia as well. I think the intelligentsia in, in Russia often played an outsized part in society. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I suspect, I may be wrong, but when the Russians and Chinese look at the West, they take too seriously articles that appear in, you know, liberal journals, not read perhaps by that many people. And they take too seriously the debates that go on in some universities. And uh, too, so they're looking, and of course, they're also looking for evidence of Western decline um, because that would, that would suit them very well. Um, very quickly on the empire of the woke, I think in a funny way, we already have it. Um, it struck me during the Vietnam War, I remember in Canada during the civil rights movement, that we would have American students or draft dodgers or whatever coming up here and they would bring their own agendas. And they kept on looking for examples of things that happened were happening in the United States in Canada. And I think we've seen the same thing with Black Lives Matters, that Black Lives Matters grew out of very specific American circumstances but I think it's been imposed often by Americans on other sorts of societies, not really taking into account what those societies are like. And so I think in a curious way, you get a sense of American exceptionalism and America being right and America knowing how to do it that goes right from left to right. They all have different prescriptions of different analyses. Mm. But this imposing of an American agenda and American concerns on other peoples is, is nothing new. Thank you. So let's go to a question. Uh, it takes up the point uh, that you made, Meg, that victory is too complete. A number of questions about did the United States lose focus? Also, uh, re re reference to Gideon's uh, point, did the United States have a grand strategy after 1991? And I just add here that I remember when Dick Cheney was Defense Secretary in 1992, uh, saying that um, the problem is that we have so much strategic depth, this is his actual phrase, that it's impossible for us to identify any future threats or even to identify future national interests. Now, I find that the most remarkably naive uh, 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 observation by an imperialist that you could possibly hope to find. If you're running an empire, there's never strategic depth because there are always new enemies, new allies mm -hmm. and, and, and new national interests. So my question here is, that if you share this view um, that victory went to their head hubris, as you say, and the, the mm. end of history, uh, which was, I suppose, permeated American thinking, doesn't this show that the United States is not a, a, a typical imperial um, power? That it has uh, this debate it with may, itself? Yeah, it, it, may, it may do, Christopher, although I think, is there not, you're a great historian as well as Margaret. I mean, haven't all empires at one stage or another exhibited hubris? Haven't all empires at one stage thought they'll last forever? Haven't all no, empires... I've heard more the grand strategy, the absence of... Okay, them. no, but I think all empire, I think all great powers in history have had a sense of mm. either their permanency or that they, they represented something that was going to endure for a very, 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 very long time. And in that regard, I suppose, the United States is no different. And, and I think that still permeates some part of the, the American strategic and cultural thinking. I don't think many Americans could envisage America not being number one. Let's put it rather crudely. You know, Americans don't do two or three, uh, put it rather bluntly. And I, whether that's an imperial uh, overhang, I don't know, but that's the way I put it rather simply. The losing of focus, that's a very good question. You know, I mean, I always argued about the Cold War. The Cold War was a genuine, genuine competition. It wasn't imaginary. Uh, as a good friend of ours at LSE has argued, uh, Mary Calder, fine person, makes great book but I, I don't think it was imaginary on the other hand i do think the cold war served certain purposes without getting into too much functionalism it certainly served many purposes for the united states it gave it a clear enemy it was an enemy which was big it had genuine capabilities it was it had serious economic power actually until the 1970s um you know it did have an industrial scientific basis and it had an ideology which we could dismiss, but nonetheless, they believed in it. I'm not sure what Putin's ideology is. And they had a massive military capability, both nuclear and conventional, and could project their power to what we used to call third world countries. Now, once that went, um, which of Gorbachev's uh, advisors said, we'll take away your threat, and then you're going to be in trouble. Well, the threat was taken away. And I think there was a sense of floundering. Yeah, I do think there was that. You couldn't in reinvent the Soviet Union. You couldn't reinvent it. Russia, in fact, is not 
the same thing as the Soviet Union. So there was in that sense a loss of focus. And I think one of the things I try and do in the book is try and show that each of the different presidents, and here we get back to the role of individuals, I think, Margaret, which I think I'm pleased to focus on. Each of the individual presidents did try to forge, if not a grand strategy so much, Christopher, at least an idea of the way the, the, way the world should be in their viewpoint. So if you take Clinton as a, an old, Good, old fashioned right wing liberal, basically, he focused on economics, geoeconomics, huge emphasis on that in his presidency, which I talk about in, 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 in the first part of my book. He also focused on democracy promotion as part and parcel of part and parcel. Now, were those two things easily married together? I, I am not so sure. Could it provide a long term strategic imperative? I don't think so. What then happens, of course, is the United States is then thrust into an entirely new world on 9-11. Now, we may decry the term war on terror. I agree with you, Mark. It's a, it's a very dubious term. Nonetheless, 9-11 happened and it reshaped uh, American policy and, and forced it into all sorts of directions, I think, were ultimately inimical. And then along comes Obama. So I just go through the list of them, Christopher. But Obama comes on and says, well, we, we've got to do something rather different. And this is where a new president coming in with a new set of ideas wants to do something different. And I think he kind of believed that America's not in decline, but America faces these emerging new powers, China being the most obvious, but not only, but other. And we've got to try and integrate them into the system. It was a kind of the last, I suppose, the last gasp of, uh, of liberal integrationism. And Trump then comes up. So each has tried. Now, but what that points to, it seems to me, is something pretty obvious, is that there is no simple grand strategy. There is no bumper sticker, the Soviet threat, you can put on the back of the car. There is no, simple, the, the Soviet Union simplified thinking and, may, and also mobilized domestic consent in ways that nothing since has been able to do. And I think uh, Barry Buzan wrote a, a very good article, many, many, many articles, of course, of his good, but he wrote an article many years ago saying, the war on terror is no substitute for the Cold War. And I think he was absolutely right. Margaret, would you like to respond? Oh, I, th I, th I, no, I think I agree mostly with Mick um, on this. I mean, I do think um, finding your purpose is always difficult for powers, and and you will get, of course, and and you do. The more open the society, the more you get debates about what your purpose should be. And I think for the United States, as for other countries, I mean, I think the same thing for Britain. There is this um, sometimes nostalgia for what seems like a simpler past. Mm -hmm. when things were clear cut and you were the unipolar power or you were the great power in the Cold War or in the case of the British, you were the hegemon in the 19th century, which can feed into how you think about the present. But you also get this tension, which I mentioned earlier on, between what you see as your, your economic interests, your, your um, strategic interests, your military interests, and what you see as the values of your society. And I think these do play in. And I think there's actually, I'm not criticizing this. I think it is right that a society that has certain values should be, prepared, be prepared to promote them. Um, it's always a balancing act, however. I mean, do you push the values of your society? Do you push um, democratic institutions on countries which you may have other reasons for not wanting to become unstable? Um, or perhaps you feel are not yet ready for democracy. I mean, I think there was a great naivety in the 1990s that democracy, and it was never properly defined, it seems too often to have meant elected institutions and, 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 and elections, sort of more, more or less free and, and corruption-free elections. And I think there wasn't enough understanding that democracy is something that is embedded in a whole set of values and ways of looking at the world. And I think we need a bit of humility too. Um, and it's always a temptation when you're powerful not to be humble um, and not to remember that you weren't always so, so wonderful either. I mean, when you think of how long it took democratic institutions to emerge in Western countries and the fits and starts um, and, the, and the terrible dead ends that some countries went down. I mean, Germany now is a strongly democratic country with a strong constitution and strong democratic values. But think of Germany in the period before and during the Second World War. And so I think, you know, that, that making foreign policy and, and defining your strategy is never easy. But I think it helps if you have a sense of what is possible and what isn't and also have a sense of humility that you may not get it quite right. Um, and I think Mick or Gideon mentioned earlier on the importance of understanding those you're dealing with. Um, one of the fatal flaws, I think, that so often empires make, I mean, the Romans didn't make it, I think, they understood that people were different. But I think the British 
and the, the Americans even more tended to assume that everyone was like them and wanted exactly the same things. And that I think can lead you into all sorts of trouble. I think you need to understand and listen to those you're dealing with, even if you're more powerful. Thank you. Right, let's take two questions together, uh, if you may, if we may. Uh, one is on uh, hypocrisy uh, and this term rules-based international order. Uh, what are the rules? Who polices the rules? Who polices the United States when it breaks the rules? Uh, and of course, the uh, question here is about Iraq and Ukraine. And, and although we can say, obviously, Iraq wasn't a democracy and Ukraine is when two powers attacked it. The fact is, that, as we as we all know, there's an enormous amount of anti-Western sentiment out there at the moment in social media, mm. uh, which goes back to the Iraq war and perhaps even earlier to the Kosovo war. So could both of you just address that? What is the difference between the invasion of Ukraine and the invasion of Iraq in your eyes? And the second uh, point is uh, very up to date. It's about populism, which you've all touched upon. And uh, what is the threat to uh, the American uh, alliance system from people like Marine Le Pen, were she to win in two weeks' time, or, or obviously Orban, who may be the first to break Western unity on Ukraine? Mick? I'll take up the populism question, and I'll, I'll come back to double standards. I mean, I, I do agree there is double standards, but I do also think there is a difference between the, the Iraq war and what's going on in Ukraine. But we can, we can go into a, a longer discussion about that, if you like. Uh, and I, I still, in the end, do think having rules and a, a rules-based order around which we can all agree is better than having no rules at all. You know, an anarchy leads to where we are, to war. Um, oh, but on the populism question, this, is a, this also brings us back to the values issue, I think, as well, Christopher. Does populism represent a threat to a liberal-based order? To connect the two points together. I think it clearly does. Yeah. Because we go back to Trump. What did Trump represent? He represented Amer make America great again, uh, America first. Going back to the values question, he didn't think there were fundamental values would bound together something which we call, I know it's old fashioned, the West. He just thought that there were kind of transactional relations between different countries with different amounts of power. It didn't matter if either of the systems were either authoritarian or democratic, whether it was Putin or whether it was Chancellor Merkel, you know, they, it, how much power could they bring to the table? And I think that actually did, that did, I think, some significant damage. And that was, a, that was populism. That was populism in, 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 uh, as expressed by the most powerful country in the world. And that populism in turn, and again, we're going back, it seems like history, but it may not be history, Christopher, because Trump has a not an not insignificant chance of winning again in 2024. So we may not be talking about ancient history, we may be talking about the future. Trump then, in, it was a huge encouragement to a number of other things going on in the world, which I personally did not feel very comfortable with. You know, it was an encouragement to what's happening in Hungary. It was an encouragement to the illiberal powers, the illiberal uh, democracies, if I can call them that, in, in, in Central Europe. It was certainly an encouragement to Bolsonaro in Brazil. It was an encouragement to the worst aspects of the, of the Modi administration in India. And I think most authoritarian countries around the world took it as read that Trump doesn't really care about values. He doesn't really care about democracy. He doesn't care about the rule of law. He doesn't, he doesn't care about that old concept which used to be called the West. So I think it does make a huge difference. And in the case of France, I think it'll make a, a fantastically big difference. <laughs> I mean, I've got no, no, no great illusions of Monsieur Macron, believe me. I mean, he's made so many mistakes over the last few years. I, I, I get that. But I mean, if the choice is between Macron, an imperfect liberal, and uh, Le Pen, um, who is a, a perfect expression of populism, who has expressed some very positive views to Putin, then I know where I, and I think it would make a huge difference. It would send a shockwave right around the European Union, as great as, if not more, than the shockwave created by Brexit. Mm -hmm. Margaret. Um, yes, I think, I agree with Mick. I mean, I think rules, no matter how imperfect and how badly enforced are better than no rules. But having said that, I think we have to accept that the West and in particular the United States, because the United States really did act unilaterally. I mean, although it had support from Tony Blair um, on the whole, it acted unilaterally, and it, it would have gone into Iraq whether or not Britain supported it, and we all know that. And I think the 
United States threw away a huge amount of mm -hmm. moral capital when it did that. Um, the excuse for going into Iraq was never good. I think it, it generally was supported even by Putin in Russia um, when it went into Afghanistan. I mean, there was a feeling that the terrorist attack on the United States, supported as it was by the Taliban government, or at least uh, condoned by the Taliban government, was a step too far. And I think there would have been a great deal of sympathy in the United States if it had gone in, dealt with the Taliban, and then got out. But like a lot of empires, its, its goals were much grander, and it wanted to transform Afghan society. It wanted to do all sorts of things. The, the agenda kept expanding the longer it stayed there. Um, that, I think, was bad enough. But Iraq, I think, was a war of choice. It was a preventative war. It turned out that the evidence was extremely dodgy. And what has happened, of course, to the, the, the price has been paid much more by the people of Iraq than it has been paid by the people of the United States. Um, you know, hundreds of thousands of Iraqis have been killed or displaced. And, and I think that has left the United States really significantly weakened. It's still a great military power. But that plus its evident willingness to break the law, um, Guantanamo, Abu Ghraib. I mean, these are things which should not be forgotten. Mm. Now, having said that, that does not excuse what, excuse what Putin is doing in Ukraine today. It is clearly an act of aggression. It is clearly against the wishes of the Ukrainian people. I mean, he can talk as much as he like about Ukrainians really being Russians and part of this great spiritual unity, but the Ukrainians themselves have a voice. And in fact, I mean, as an historian, I, I, I think I can say this, I think the history actually is irrelevant. I don't think it matters how long Ukraine was part of Russia for how many centuries and whether um, Kiev and Rus was, was established in Kiev and whether um, Russia became Christian because Vladimir um, in the 10th century converted to Christianity and that therefore that gives Russia a claim on Ukrainian territory. I mean, I believe very strongly in the right of self-determination. And I think the people who live in Ukraine have a perfect right to live within their borders peaceably. And so, yes, it is, I think, um, something that we should never forget that the United States, I think, behaved very wrongly in, in Iraq and, and is, is, I think, rightly paid a price for that. Although, as I say, the Iraqi people have paid a much greater price and are still paying it. But that does not, I think, condone what Putin is doing. Mm -hmm. And I think if we live in a world in which countries think they can use military force to seize territory, um, we will be back to something like the 18th century or the scramble for Africa, um, where there is no control over those with power. Those who, those who are um, the toughest, those who are prepared to use their power, will make life misery for their neighbors and often, often for their own people. And so, yes, there's, there's a fair amount of hypocrisy here, but I still think better than better than nothing and i think we have to try and do what we can to rebuild what is i think a badly damaged international rules-based order excellent now here's a big question about the future um from your old friend jonathan femby uh mick oh yeah um, i normally i don't identify people right. who ask questions but i will since you're your old chums can china ever replace the united states as a global uh, hegemon. He didn't use the word hegemon, but I will no. use it. Or yeah. is what we're seeing a battle for hegemony in the region of East Asia, the Western Pacific, etc.? Yeah, okay. I, I, <laughs> that's not just the future, Jonathan. I think that's where we are now. Um, well, let, let's be blunt. Um, the war on terror did not replace the Cold War. And uh, uh, replace the uh, the Cold War as the strategic purpose of the United States. Uh, if anything, it led it led, led to some outcomes which were entirely negative from America's point of view, including many of the things that Margaret just alluded to. By the way, thinking that we were facing a, t a terrorist threat, America did all sorts of things it should not have done, and which is now is now paying a price for with the way in which it's being used against it. You know, in in the ideological battle. Uh, being waged by by China and Russia against say, oh, you did it. We're only really doing the same kind of thing. It comes back to haunt them, and I think the war on terror has come back to to haunt them in in, in that sense. But to answer Jonathan's question, China is both less of a problem but more of a problem. It's like it's a very English answer, isn't it? on the one hand, but on the other, I think it's more of a problem from the one very obvious point of view that unlike Russia, it has a dynamic, apparently efficient uh, and viable economy, 
and can export a very large amount of its money around the world to buy influence, to buy for doing what exactly all great powers have done in the past. I'm not criticizing it for that. As John Mearsheimer has often said, China's only doing what America did when it was on the rise. You know, fair enough. But China just has a lot more money and, and a lot more clout, therefore, um, from that point of view, economic clout. Now, now, the Soviet Union had lots and lots of things, ideology, military power, a narrative about the world moving towards communism. We will bury you. You remember that famous phrase by Nikita Khrushchev in 1960. China doesn't have that kind of narrative, but it does have money. From that point of view, therefore, it will give China a great deal more influence than the Soviet Union. Because in the end, we can even see this with Russia today, I think. You know, what's the one instrument that Putin has got? It's not economic power. It's crude, straightforward military power. Now, China has much more than just military power. There's a vast range of economic power as well. And that therefore makes it more of a problem. Why I think it's less of a problem, and I, I don't want to kind of go, go against everybody's kind of strategic thinking about this China being the great challenge of the 21st century. But I think the, I think the Biden administration has said it that on a whole range of issues, China and the United States, in spite of these fundamental differences and in spite of its relationship with Russia, um, China, nonetheless, has certain stake in the international order. I mean, one of the reasons it's clearly upset about what's happening in Ukraine is clearly this is going to have a major knock-on effect onto the global economy. A global economy in which it has an enormous stake. It is a stakeholder in that global economy. Um, so therefore, from, from that point of view, it is both more of a threat, but less of a threat insofar as it has a stake within the system a state which the Soviet Union never had. So I, that's the way I try to answer very, very briefly. Less of a threat at one level, but more of a threat because it has so much money at the other, but less of a threat because it isn't like the Soviet Union. I don't think it is purporting an ideology to the same degree. And it has a stake in, it has a stake in the world market, which the Soviet Union never did. Margaret, we have uh, two minutes, if you could <laughs> say a few words. Well, I think, yes, I think what will, it, China, I think, is a question mark at the moment. I think it has great power. It has great military power, but it hasn't really ever been a great military power. Um, it has fought in wars, but it's not been a strong part of, of the Chinese self-perception of themselves. And we, I think, are realizing increasingly that you can have great armies and navies and air forces, um, can you then use them effectively? I mean, the last time, as, as far as I remember, but I may be wrong, that China fought a war was against Vietnam in the 1970s, and it did very badly against a much weaker power. Now, China's much stronger today, but I suspect also looking at the resistance that Russia's met in Ukraine, that China may well now be thinking again mm. about just how easy it might be, for example, to take Taiwan. Um, which would present all sorts of logistical problems because it has to cross over 100 miles of, of open water. So I think that's an issue. I think that we also perhaps don't know enough about internal stresses and strains within China. I mean, all countries have them. And the ways in which the Chinese government, the authorities have handled the COVID pandemic, seems to be producing, certainly in Shanghai today, a fair amount of resistance from people. You know, they claim to be more competent than other governments around the world may be coming, may be coming under threat. Um, and the amassing of, of power in the hands of, of one man, again, may in, in the long term be a bad sign for China, um, because as Gideon Rackman said before, if you have great power and you're surrounded by those who tell you you're, you're, you're bright and wonderful, then you may make mistakes. And so I think China is indeed a fascinating and very powerful country but it like any other country it's going to have its own internal challenges to deal with as much as it's going to have to deal with its neighbors and i would just finish make one note and that china's diplomacy which um tends to be you know ascribed all sorts of you know extraordinary subtlety and so on china's managed to make a neighbor of virtually every one of its neighbors an enemy of virtually every one of its neighbors which i wouldn't say is great diplomacy so i think I would say if, if I was on a jury, I, I, would, I would return a verdict of not yet proved. <laughs> well, thank you very much to, to both of you. I, I wonder, Mick, if the United States does lose its hegemonic position, uh, we will remember you know, the famous story of Richard Nixon when he had to resign because of the Spaniel checkers, the corruption charge. You won't have me to kick around any longer. Uh, <laughs> and, 
You know, the one thing that the United States desperately wants to be liked and loved, uh, which neither Russia nor China have the slightest interest in at all. And we may miss a world in which a hegemonic power doesn't want to be liked or lived, but we will yet perhaps live to see that. Thank you very much, both of you, and, and also to, to Gideon, who is not with us at the moment, for, uh, I think, an absolutely wonderful discussion. So many more questions in the Q&A box. So we could certainly have spent another hour or so. But uh, thank you both for coming along. Mick, uh, during the uh, discussion, we've been putting on the screen, flashing on the screen, oh. your book and how to get it. So I hope you will get a few sales. And thank you very much to the audience for staying yeah. with us. Uh, and I apologize to those people who questions were not, uh, I was not able to actually ask on your behalf. Thank you again, and look forward to seeing you at another LSE Ideas event. Bye for now. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you to Ideas. Thank you, Margaret, and thank you, Gideon. All the very best. Bye, everybody.